for joining me. I live in Boston and was just before I made my way from Boston where it was snowing and in the teens to then Texas um, in Austin where I anticipated it would be beautiful but it was raining and gray. And then I arrived uh, in Oakland and I was like, this is glorious. This is why everybody <laughs> loves living in California. So on top of all of the other exciting events that are happening on campus and the beautiful sunshine, I really appreciate you all being here with me this afternoon. And I'm so grateful for the invitation um, to speak to a mix of scholars and graduate students and a really an interdisciplinary group here at the Institute. I'm just I'm quite honored. So my, my first research project, The Injustice Never Leaves You, is a, a history of anti-Mexican violence in the border in Texas. It's a history of racial violence that most people don't know about. Um, historians of the borderlands and uh, Latino history know about the history of anti-Mexican violence, but broadly, more publicly, um, in the United States and across the world, uh, if you say something, if you mention to people that, that Mexicans were lynched in the United States or that they were victims of racial violence, most people don't know that history. So um, the, the project that I developed, um, uh, that first uh, book project, helped me develop... Um, a book that told history of particular cases of anti-Mexican violence to introduce the history of lynchings of Mexicans. It has a much longer history that predates the U.S.-Mexico War, um, but also to speak more specifically to police violence. And so it's something that's unique um, in the history of anti-Mexican violence that historians have documented state-sanctioned racial violence. Um, and in Texas, that came in multiple forms. And so there was an intersecting regime of anti-Mexican violence um, at the hands of vigilantes, local law enforcement, the state police, the Texas Rangers, um, and also U.S. soldiers. And so in the early 20th century, um, this intersecting regime really terrorized ethnic Mexican communities in the Southwest. Um, in Texas, the, the criminalization of, of Mexicans was largely uh, conducted by uh, profiling anyone who looked Mexican, whether they had American citizenship, or there were Mexican nationals living in the United States and in Texas, they were profiled as bandits um, and a threat to the nation state. So as I was developing that project, I kept finding other cases of racial violence um, that hadn't been documented by historians, but also um, that helped to show a broader, more interconnected history of racial violence in Texas. And so the, the project mapping violence that I'll be speaking about today um, is, is new, it's ongoing, I've been developing it since 2014, um, but I'm really going to be showing the, the, giving you some examples of cases that call for a more in, uh, an archive of racial violence that embraces different forms of racial violence and terror, um, and also targeting different groups. Um, I'll also be sharing some examples of um, the, the questions that I still have um, that are unanswered as I'm developing this project. So I was trained as a historian in ethnic studies, um, but also somebody who was trained in American studies. And this second project is, is encouraging me to venture out into the digital frontier, mm -hmm. which is something, as somebody who's not trained in the digital humanities, I'm developing a new skill set um, to help bring this history to the public. Um, so I'll be excited to talk to you about why I came to the digital humanities, what I think mapping can do to help make these histories public, but also to, at thinking as a historian who just finished a book, um, one chapter, for example, that covers uh, the history of one lynching um, is nearly 20,000 words long. And so to think about how to translate that kind of methodological practice and narrative practice into a digital form um, certainly raises some issues. And so there are some shortcomings. So, uh, you know, more broadly, I'm interested in fundamental questions regarding the role of history and the humanities in reckoning with long consequences of the histories of slavery, conquest, genocide, colonization, and brutal policing regimes in the United States. Although there's now international consensus on the importance of confronting traumatic histories, what I've found is that local residents in the United States too often have borne the burden of demanding a public reckoning with legacies of state violence. So I believe that to change public understandings of the past and its relation to our present moment also requires new narratives for making res research available to the public and really to think about what research, the responsibility of historians and researchers to actually think about how to transform public understandings of the past in addition to, but as a fundamental part of our work in shaping academic conversations. 
So in my first book, The Injustice Never Leaves You, a return to a period of terror acknowledged by historians but forgotten in public memory. In the late 19th and early 20th century, the murder of ethnic Mexicans was common on the Texas-Mexico border. Historians estimate that between 1848 and 1928 in Texas alone, 232 ethnic Mexicans were lynched by mobs. But these tabulations only tell part of the story. In addition to these acts by mobs, state police and local police committed extra-legal acts of violence that are often overlooked in lynching statistics. When including acts of extra-legal violence at the hands of law enforcement, the numbers of victims of racial violence in Texas soars. The decade between 1910 and 1920 was a particularly brutal period when ethnic Mexicans were criminalized and harshly policed by an intersecting regime of vigilante state police, local police, and army soldiers. Historians estimate that hundreds, if not thousands, of ethnic Mexicans, citizens of the United States, and Mexico alike were murdered. Um, and so that estimate here of, of hundreds to thousands, it's such a broad estimate because we don't actually have a concrete record of all of the people that were killed. Violence at the hands of police, I argue, has for too long been shielded in a cloak of legal authority. So to give you one example of the kinds of cases, and, and one of the, the, there's multiple reasons why we don't have um, a, a comprehensive archive or list of the, the people of ethnic Mexican descent uh, who were murdered in this period between 1910 and 1920, but one of the ways in which this, this history has been suppressed was the, the role of state police officers that refused to keep records. And so between 1910 and 1920, Texas Rangers, local law enforcement, they were expected to keep records of the numbers of people that they arrested. Um, if they happened to shoot somebody and kill somebody, there were supposed to be records um, included in their, their reports to the state um, administrators. Um, but in, during this decade, one of the practices was to actually not keep records. And so one example um, is the double murder of Jesus Bazan and Antonio Longoria, who were murdered in September 1915. This is a photograph of Jesus Bazan here and a photograph of Antonio Longoria and his wife, Antonia. So these were both uh, men who were members of the landed Tejano elite in the early 20th century. Uh, Longoria could, their family could trace their possession of land in South Texas back to Spanish land grants. So they had lived in this border region for generations. That's also a flag to remind us that this is a history of, 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 of layered histories of colonization. So these were, were members of a Tejano uh, community that had, had helped to colonize and settle this part of South Texas. Um, when they were murdered in September 1915, Antonio Longoria was the Hidalgo County Land Commissioner. He also, in that decade, held teaching certificates. Um, and so both of these men were economically, politically, and socially prominent in Hidalgo County. Um, now, in September 1915, their ranch was raided and some horses were stolen. And so Antonio Longoria and Jesus Bazan had to make the decision about whether or not to report this robbery to local law enforcement officers. If they had chosen not to report the robbery and men described as Mexican bandits were later found in possession of those horses, they could have been accused of aiding Mexican bandits by supplying them with horses. On the other hand, reporting this robbery to Texas Rangers meant that they were going to be interacting with these law enforcement agents who had um, uh, reputations for um, cold-blooded murder. They took the chance, they traveled to a nearby ranch where a local Texas Ranger camp was stationed, reported the robbery, um, and after witnesses noted that after interacting with the Texas Rangers, the two men left to return on horseback to their ranch, and a uh, group of Texas Rangers and local residents loaded into a Model T Ford, followed the men, and shot them both in the back. So, in the end, these two men died. Their murders were witnessed. Uh, by people that lived on the ranch and worked on the ranch, um, but there was no investigation by the local sheriff, the Texas Rangers that participated. Captain uh, Henry Ransom didn't write a report of this shooting. Um, and the local press didn't cover the event. Um, and so it's one of these cases that is striking for a number of reasons. Um, it gives us a sense of the disposability of Mexican life, um, landed 
elected officials could be murdered without consequence. There was no investigation, no prosecutions. Um, the, the men also, the local county didn't issue any death certificates. And so it, as a historian trying to recover histories of racial violence like this, this police murder, um, what we then have to rely on are community memories um, that preserve these histories and families that preserve documents like these photographs of the family. And so this is a photograph of Epi Menia Bazan and her granddaughters on the family ranch. Um, men like Jesus Pazan and Antonio Longoria that were murdered, that were landed elite members, were targeted in this period for their land. So this was a history of conquest and colonization where you had Anglo farmers moving into South Texas and trying to displace Mexican um, residents that had economic, political, and social influence. And so the common phrase during this era was, you don't buy from the husband, you buy from the widow. And many of the other cases that I found, widows and families did abandon their property in fear. But in this case, the Bazan, Epigmenia Bazan and Antonia Longoria remained on their property. Um, and so, as a result, we have access to the family story, the family history of the double murder of Jesus Bazan and Antonio Longoria. Um, and what that helps us also to, to, to think about is the importance of the need for historical research to not just focus on the, the violent event itself, but to ask questions about the lives and the families that were impacted by this kind of racial violence. And so thinking about, um, in talking to descendants of Bazana Longoria, one of the, 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 the questions that, um, or the, the, the research interest that I was introduced to by Norma Longoria Rodriguez, who's one of the descendants, is she said, you know, we, we know that these two men lived, we have no records of their death, but all we can do is try to remember who they were and how people survived in the aftermath. And so this photograph of Epic Minia Bazan and her, um, some of her granddaughters is a reminder of the need to think more broadly about histories of racial violence and trying to move beyond a body count um, in our studies of, of the impact of this violence. And of course, that's in conversation with um, historians like Kadada Williams that that says for the history of lynchings as well, we have to look more broadly um, to trace the longer legacies of racial violence. Um, so one of the, the, in conversation with people like Norma Longoria Rodriguez who had access to the records of Antonio Longoria and his um, civic duties and his teaching certificates and the family photographs, she also explained to me uh, when I asked her about what this history meant to her children. Um, because she was somebody who was in a line of a generations that had preserved this family history. And she said to me, it's an injustice, it never leaves you, it's inherited loss. And that quote was the inspiration for the title of the book, The Injustice Never Leaves You. And what that prompted me to do in, my first in the first book was, was actually to make sure that people like Norma Longoria Rodriguez and her family history were a part of the telling of this history, this event of this double murder in September 1915 as a way of tracing out the longer legacies of racial violence. So it's one thing and an important project to try to trace the impact of racial violence and institutional histories, right? So this history of racial violence within the Texas Ranger Police Force, but then also to think about it in terms of its impact of community memory um, and social relations. And so these cases, people like Norma Longoria Rodriguez remind us that, uh, that time does not heal all wounds, and that we actually need an effort to publicly address and reckon with these histories of racial violence. And so um, I've been collaborating with a group of historians uh, for Refusing to Forget. It's a project, it's a nonprofit, uh, and, and the, the collaborators for the group are Ben Johnson, who's at Oyola, John Bonan Gonzalez, who's at UT Austin, Sonia Hernandez is at Texas A&M, in College Station in Trinidad Gonzalez, who, he, it, who himself is a descendant of um, racial violence. He is in South Texas College. And so we came together in 2013 to uh, try to bridge this gap from what we saw between the historical advances in the field of history by historians that were publishing books on the history of anti-Mexican violence. Um, you know, the first being uh, Américo Paredes that published with his pistol in his hand in the 1950s. Um, and since then, a series of historians have, you know, dozens of books help us account for this period of violence. Um, but that advance in the field of history is not reflected 
in the way that Texas history is taught in public schools mm -hmm. or in the work that cultural institutions do to inscribe this, this version, this myth of Texas history that, that not only doesn't address this, this period of racial violence but actually celebrates it by describing it as a period of progress, right? This is when the, the frontier was settled and made safe for Anglo capital and also for Anglo life. So some of the work that we've done is um, installing, working with the Texas Historical Commission to unveil historical markers along the U.S.-Mexico border. So we finally, in November, unveiled a historical marker for Jesus Bazan and Antonio Longoria, and so the descendants are here. Um, this is, I think this is the light. Oh, this is Norma Longoria Rodriguez right here. Um, we also worked with the Texas State History Museum, the Bob Bullock Museum in Austin. Is anybody here from Texas? Okay, so um, so in terms of the rich, you know, Texas culture, you know, it's inscribed on the outside in, of, in pink granite, the story of Texas. Um, and so we worked with the Bullock Museum uh, so that we st starting in 2014 and finally in 2016, we unveiled Life and Death on the Border, 1910 to 1920, um, which was a 10-week temporary exhibit. But as the exhibit... Um, it was the first time that a Texas cultural institution in the state was actually acknowledging not only this period of racial violence, but more specifically saying in plain, you know, uh, museum text that's accessible to the seventh graders that come to visit the, the museum, um, that the state was responsible for calling for this period of state-sanctioned violence, for giving Texas Rangers and other law enforcement agents impunity Literally, governor is saying, we will give you our pardoning power, use our pardoning power to defend you if you're ever prosecuted. Um, but then also to, 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 to put on display um, the role of cultural institutions in suppressing this history for too long. And, and these public projects have been wildly successful. So in just this 10-week span, over 40,000 people came to see this exhibit in Texas, which is a, you know, for anybody who says, you know, that these histories are too violent or they're too controversial, that the public isn't interested, you know, that number of 40,000, I just like to say it all the time as a reminder that public audiences are actually demanding and calling for these kinds of public projects. So um, this is the first marker unveiling that we had in, in, in the Valley. So I'm happy to talk more about, the, you know, this work was not easy. It was loaded with controversy at different stages. Um, but I'm happy to talk more about the politics of, of, of working with state cultural institutions, but also institutions like the Texas Historical Commission um, in bringing about these projects. So, so we, I think about finding ways to make these, uh, history, uh, these histories public as one important form of redress. And in many ways, it's taking the weight off of families and communities that have been doing the work on their own by preserving their own family archives, by holding memorials. Um, and one thing that, that, that faculty, that historians, that credentialed PhD historians can do is actually leverage some of their authority to call on these state cultural institutions to participate in reckoning with this period of violence. So all of that to introduce Mapping Violence, which is a, a project that I've been developing since 2014 uh, with a group of students at Brown University that, that really takes to heart the question about reckoning with racial violence um, and the, the roadblock that I kept seeing that you can't actually fully reckon with a period of racial violence until you know the extent of the violence. Right? So if you don't have a record, it, uh, you know, um, then, then the work that you're doing is partial. Right, so having four markers unveiled in Texas that address this history of racial violence is, is not enough. Um, it's a start, and it's important critical work, but it's not enough. So I kept thinking about um, what it means to try to reckon with violence with this incomplete record. And as I was completing the research for the first book, I kept finding cases of racial violence that had not been acknowledged by historians, but also fell outside of other traditional archives of racial violence that we tend to think about, like the NAACP archives of lynchings or the Tuskegee records that include uh, lynchings of African Americans. And so I saw first a need for a record of anti-Mexican violence in Texas that included both mob violence and police violence. But I saw a need for a more inclusive archive that included some of these cases that kept falling out of these other collecting efforts. So uh, one example, just quickly I'll go through some cases. Um, 
uh, are those cases of violence that did not end in death, right? So if you're thinking about lynchings or police murder, again, you're relying on a body count to give you access to the scope of violence. Um, and I kept finding cases of ethnic Mexicans and African Americans that were um, arrested and tortured um, in an effort to, to force these men and women to um, confess to crimes that they didn't commit. Um, one of these crimes, uh, oh, so mapping violence. One of these crimes was uh, Jesus, Bas Jesus Hernandez and um, his son, who was unnamed in historical records. On August 1918, they were taken into custody of Texas Rangers in South Texas and interrogated. Jose Hernandez was flogged and beat in front of his son. Um, and so that is a case he later testified to this abuse in front of a panel of legislators that were investigating abuse by Texas Rangers. And so we have access to this case of abuse um, because of his own testimony, but also because he was a Mexican national and so a Mexican consulate was involved in trying to, to expose the abuse uh, to the Texas government. Another case of anti-black violence that I found that was not included in the lynching records um, is the case of the Cabanes family. Um, and so in 1918, the NAACP did include in its reports um, that the Cabanis family in Dodge, Texas, and East Texas was lynched by mob in June 1918. Um, but it's a, a, a gripping case and a horrific case, um, not only because an Anglo mob surrounded the Cabanis family in their home and opened fire. The house eventually turned, um, caught fire, and, and so um, it's a, a, a horrifying account of Sarah Cabaness, who's trying to save her children from this fire. Um, ultimately, the mob um, shoots the remaining family members. One daughter um, escapes with her life. Um, but in the NAACP archives, they take great care to explain the lynching of this family. Early reports included the lynching of George Cabaness, who was one of Sarah's sons. Um, and it turned out that he actually wasn't in the home and wasn't a victim of the mob violence, but he had been shot days earlier by local law enforcement who accused him of resisting arrest, and he was being arrested for um, evading the draft. And so they, he was on a list um, that, uh, that the draft bureau provided to Texas law enforcement to find, um, and <coughs> the sheriff in Dodge, Texas, accused him of resisting arrest and shot him. And so this was this case in which George Cabaness, in early accounts by the NAACP, was included in a list of lynching victims and was later removed um, on the grounds that he wasn't actually a victim of mob violence but had been killed by this sheriff while resisting arrest. And so as a historian who studies the, how interconnected mob violence and police violence is, this is one of those glaring cases where the life and the debt, we have to actually look suspiciously at this police account that accuses George of trying to resist arrest. Um, but in the early 20th century, when the NAACP is creating these archives, they are making difficult decisions about which victims to include <coughs> in their lists. And they're thinking not only about their own sociological limits and their methods for who they include and who they don't include, but they're also thinking about the public reports that they make. And somebody like George being accused of resisting arrest is not the most sympathetic victim, right? They're not as sympathetic as Sarah, who's, who they can portray and give the account of her bravery in trying to save the lives of her children and the tragedy that befell them in June 1918. And so in this archive that I'm thinking about for mapping violence, I'm, I'm thinking about these difficult decisions that early sociologists did, that early uh, activists did in creating these archives um, and actually trying to figure out how to, how to have an archive of violence that can include these different, these different forms of racial violence um, to again get a sense of a more expansive idea of, of the kinds of terror that people suffered in this period. Um, I'll just skip over this really briefly, but Thomas Johnson is another person who's of African, African American living in Texas who in 1918 publicly testified um, to being arrested by Texas Rangers and Sweet Rodder, accused of of uh, robbery, being interrogated, being threatened with mob violence, and ultimately he's released from police custody because his wife hires an attorney, calls on his employer to help her raise the funds for his bond, 
and ultimately is able to find where they have hidden him in a neighboring town jail and have him released before he is a victim of mob violence. And so this is, again, one of those cases that is dynamic in the way that it gives us a sense of how many people were impacted by these acts of, of violence, but it also, again, um, gives us insight into thinking through victims that, again, suffered. Um, and in his testimony, you hear the weight of just those days in police custody and the impact that it had on him. He describes not being able to go back to work for two weeks um, because he was in such bad health. Um, but that, again, gives us a sense of the need to expand our archive when we're thinking about collecting cases of racial violence. So um, in addition to the need for a more inclusive archive, I also found cases that hinted at how interconnected these histories of racial violence in Texas are. Um, and so one case that I'll, did I have a, do I have a little slide for him? Oh, it's in my, no, not yet. Um, so one Texas Ranger, uh, his name was James Monroe Fox, and he's a, a Texas Ranger that I was introduced to in my research on another case called the Bodney Massacre. And it's a massacre that took place in West Texas in 1918. <coughs> Um, and Texas uh, Ranger James Monroe Fox was the captain of Company B of the Texas Rangers that coordinated efforts with a local cavalry group to descend on the community of Bois in the middle of the night, awaken families from their beds, and separate men, 15 men and boys, from their families and execute them. They were in police custody, they were unarmed, and they were executed. Um, so in 1918, he is a Texas Ranger that I was introduced to. Um, through that archival research on that massacre. And as I studied other cases of racial violence, I found James Monroe Fox reappearing in the archive. And so in 1915, he's in South Texas, and he's photographed posing by lynched Mexican bodies. Um, so for people who have seen these photographs of Texas Rangers on horseback with ropes tied to Mexican corpses, he is one of the Texas Rangers that's been preserved in that photograph. Um, as I researched his early career uh, in law enforcement before he actually joined the Texas Rangers, um, he was in central Texas working for, um, as a sheriff deputy, and he is reported to have shot an African-American man who's unnamed in newspaper and police records, um, but he shot an African-American young man for quote-unquote resisting arrest which was a common practice used um, by police to justify police shootings. And so in thinking about people like James Monroe Fox, he and others have these resumes that give us a sense of how Texas Rangers actually moved throughout the state, targeting different racial and ethnic groups. And, and James Monroe Fox, because of the brutality of the Bodhmi massacre, because it actually um, stirred up not just local uh, resistance, but also international attention because Mexican consulates were again involved in trying to seek justice for these families. Um, he was forced to resign in 1918, um, but not prosecuted. And so somebody like James Monroe Fox was then allowed to just pick up his old career in local law enforcement. And so he became a de uh, deputy sheriff in Travis County, later was in Nueces County, only to return to the Texas Rangers in the early 1920s. And so the, 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 when I think about the archive of racial violence, I'm again thinking about families that are impacted by violence, the, the cases themselves, but also thinking about ways that we can trace um, institutional histories that give us the sense of what are the consequences of not prosecuting these kinds of crimes 100 years ago. And that moves beyond just looking at specific cases. Um, another way that I think about uh, needing to ex expand and our, our idea of racial violence and how to bring it to the public audiences is also by thinking about the interconnected histories of civil rights efforts. <coughs> and so in 1919, it's a pivotal year for thinking about when these histories of, of civil rights efforts to end anti-Mexican violence and the mobilization around uh, passing state and federal anti-lynching legislation come together and converge in places like Austin, Texas. So in 1919, uh, Texas State Representative Jose Tipanales, who's on the left here, he filed um, a House bill that actually resulted in a Texas State uh, legislative investigation into Texas Ranger abuse in 1919. Um, it resulted in uh, a two-week public hearing. Um, 83 witnesses were called to testify to the abuse by the Texas Rangers. 
Um, but and, and it resulted in a transcript um, that is available, now it's been preserved and available online. It's over 1,600 pages of testimony and evidence that's included in that hearing. Um, so Canales is, is, is leading this charge to investigate the Texas Rangers in 1919 at the same time that the NAACP has its sights on Texas as one of the states that needs to pass anti-lynching legislation. Um, so the National Secretary visited Texas, visited Austin in the summer of 1919, um, and, and, and really they thought about Texas really urgently because between 1889 and 1919, Texas had lynched at least 335 uh, black Texans, which was only fewer than Georgia and Mississippi. So Texas as, as, a, as, a, as a state was third in the NAACP list of states that had these rampant uh, uh, occurrences of, of lynchings of African Americans. Um, but again, that number doesn't include victims that, were bought, that, that, that suffered from police violence or died um, in the hands of police. Um, so these two men sort of are, are not only interacting with the governor, sending telegrams, um, Ganales having public hearings, but they also both come, suffer from intimidation from Texas Rangers. So Ganales' life is threatened um, while the hearings are ongoing and even before the hearings start. Um, the national secretary in 1919, when he visits Texas, he's actually beat by a mob, including a local county judge. Um, and the state response to these acts of violence are not to prosecute the participants in the mob, but actually to give, Governor Hobby gives a warning um, to the NAACP that that is what justice looks like in Texas and discouraging uh, any more um, representatives from the national office to travel to Texas to try to pass anti-lynching legislation. Um, and John Tilliday was also in Texas, uh, not only to try to help meet with the governor to, to encourage the state to, to pass anti-lynching legislation, but also to support local chapters that were being intimidated by Texas Rangers. So in 1918, at the time of, this, of, of, of the National Secretary's visit, there are 33 chapters in Texas, um, in, of the NAACP across the state. Um, by 1921, after this years of intimidation by Texas Rangers, um, there's only seven that remain. Um, but bringing to light these histories reveal how the state undermines uh, civil rights efforts by both Mexicans and Texans living in Texas, but it also allows us to consider the multiple histories of residents that fought for social justice. And so it's an important counterpoint to just marking and documenting episodes of racial violence, the need to then also mark social efforts to contest and push back and fight for, for human rights in this era. Um, so all of that, I think, is important to keep in mind in thinking through what, how ma mapping violence is developing. Um, so mapping violence is trying to shift long-term patterns followed by historians. It's trying to create an archive that moves beyond archives for African-American violence versus Mexican -American violence. And it's trying to think, especially in Texas, because it is this place where these histories uh, were not segregated geographically or temporally. Um, but it also helps us to think more broadly about the interconnected legacies of colonization, slavery, and genocide that intersect in Texas. It is truly a part of the frontier, a part of the South, and a part of the West. Um, and and uh, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and move on here to, this, to the goals, because I think I've covered this other section here. Um, so in terms of the goals for mapping violence is to create a record of this interconnected histories of violence in Texas between 1900 and 1930, and I'm happy to think through the periodization of people later in the Q&A, um, and to map the diverse strategies used to seek redress. So if you think about the Bodenid Massacre as being one episode that's mapped, I would al we're also thinking of ways to include the civil rights, uh, the, the claims that are filed by the widows of the Bodenid Massacre that actually try to hold the United States go government accountable for the denial of justice for their loved ones. And so thinking about holding both these histories of racial violence and the diverse strategies used to seek justice. We're also, another goal of the project is to make histories publicly available as one form of redress, as an effort to shift public understandings of the past and to inform current debates. It doesn't, you know, I probably don't need to say this, but the counties where we have these historical marker unveilings were also the site 
of uh, the ongoing crisis on the border. So each county where we have unveiled a historical marker is also the site of detention centers for current immigrants and refugees in the United States, but also the sites of, of large border patrol operations. Um, and so we're thinking about the, the need to make these histories publicly public as one form of addressing the injustice of racial violence in the past, but also seeing that work as critically in integral to understanding the fights for civil rights and human rights that are ongoing today. And of course, we're also thinking about ways to inspire new research and to identify new methods for digital storytelling. And that's um, where I want to head next. Um, but uh, So I'll move through this really quickly. We're thinking about multiple racial and ethnic groups. So I've talked about African-American and ethnic Mexicans, but we have also found, and I found cases in my research of Asian American, Native American, and European immigrant minorities suffering from these forms of racial violence. Um, and we're also including, again, more broadly, these multiple forms of racial violence moving beyond just mob violence or police shootings, um, also to include episodes of torture, rape, mutilation, and physical assault. Um, and then in terms of the kinds of strategies for seeking justice that we have started to uh, accumulate in our data, um, it includes court, using courts, uh, public protests, armed resistance, the use of journalism uh, to shed light on some of these cases, the efforts to pass legislation, um, the call for international investigations, and the role of foreign consuls in um, helping to seek justice. And the project is also designing for multiple audiences. So that means that we are thinking in the effort to recover, but also to make public about multiple groups. And so this includes scholars and researchers who we know want access to the research um, to inform their own work, access to primary sources, access to our, our brief overviews of the events, but we're also thinking very cautiously about educators, K through 12 and university um, faculty and teachers that want access to lesson plans and primary sources to help supplement their teaching. Um, and so each public history event that I've either helped to run or attended, there's always a teacher in the audience who wants to know how they can use this in their classrooms. And so teachers we know are underpaid and overworked and so providing uh, lesson plans and primary sources is something that we're building into the project. Um, we're also thinking about everyday users, people who would stumble upon a digital project like this, um, who wouldn't necessarily be able to make meaning from a map with dots. Um, and so we're developing curated content that includes historical essays, biographies um, of civil rights activists, but also some of these Texas Rangers, and the development of digital tours that would give people access to move through a, a thematic tour of this history. And we are also keeping in mind that one of the audience for this project are descendants of violence. In some cases, there are people who have been trying to make their families' histories public, and so they are looking for opportunities to share some of their, their primary sources, um, but also descendants uh, um, who are looking for more information. And so um, this helps us to think not only about the ways in which there's room for crowdsourcing to build the archive through interaction with descendants, but also the need for the tone to be very cognizant of these broad public audiences, but also descendants, who in many cases, one of the things that they're insisting on are that the, that the dead, their loved ones, are treated with respect. Um, and that those layers of criminalization that they see reflected in newspaper accounts or police records, um, that we push back against that with photographs of people with people's names. Um, and the reminder that somebody's not prosecuted and they are murdered in police custody, they are considered innocent, right? And that just seems on a fundamental level um, something that descendants are looking for. So we are to hold all of these different audience needs. We have settled on the, on the use of a map um, as a way for people to um, come to the, the, the content. And so there's a few reasons. I mean, on the one hand, early mapping efforts, this is a map from the NAACP. You know, this is before you had to learn any digital tools or RTIS or um, anything to, to make a digital map. This is just you know, this is like low tech, <laughs> this is like a drawing. <laughs> but the heat map itself is so successful at conveying information. You know, lynching uh, between 1989 and 1918, the NAACP found was 
widespread across the country. There's nearly, a, you know, you struggle to find a state that doesn't have at least one account of a lynching. Um, you also get the sense from this early heat map where these lynchings were really um, centralized, the numbers of hundreds of people being lynched, um, you know, in Texas and um, the South. Um, but, but mapping can also be a way to think about not just displaying information that is already understood, finding a way to visualize what, what you have found in your data, but also to develop, um, but using digital tools can help us to reveal patterns that we wouldn't otherwise be able to, to find. And so that's part of the practice of then layering a map of anti Mexican violence with anti-black violence and actually seeing the way that the temporally and geographically these can't be separated, right? They're happening in the same places. Um, and then, so anyhow, um, so that's one of the ways that we're thinking about mapping, not just as a visualization, but also as a way, um, as Richard White has explained, that visualization is a tool to inspire more research. Um, so mapping violence, this is one early prototype of the project. We're still thinking through um, what it means to have a map that where these dots re re recognize the loss of life. Um, and so we are thinking, you know, this feels aesthetically pretty cold. <laughs> it doesn't feel like a memorial. Um, and so this is uh, just one prototype that we've looked at. Uh, but one of the ways that we're thinking about uh, having the content organized is actually to have, you know, enough introductory information so that people who come to the site can think, can figure out how to use it, figure out what a dot represents, um, figure out how to filter the content. That's, of course, going to be helpful for faceted searching uh, by researchers. Um, people will be able to take, learn how to take a curated tour, get a list of topics that they can learn about through interactive tours, um, and also how to use the timeline um, for different filtering mechanisms. And so this is just an example of, of how we're thinking people would come upon the, uh, the give you a sense of, of what it would be like to enter the Mapping Violence Project. Um, we're also playing with the different ways that people should have access to the narratives of what each dot represents. And so in this case, um, the map here would, a dot would represent the loss of, of a life. And so people would be able to read a short narrative to think about the ways in which a museum curator uh, would present this in a short um, 150 to 300 word description of the event. Um, but we're thinking through what are the best ways for people to just be able to click on dots, get the information, and to move on. Um, and also making critical decisions about what kinds of primary sources to make available. Especially when, in the case of lynchings, um, the newspaper accounts are not a critical investigation into the lynching, but oftentimes they are using what you would call hate speech um, to describe the dead. Um, and there's, a, there's a, the tone in the, the narrative doesn't beg questions about the... the the innocence or guilt of somebody, they are being condemned. Um, and so, so I still have questions and pause uh, regarding just making public uh, these, these uh, archival documents. Um, this is, these are the, the dots that we currently have mapped. This is only a selection um, of, the, of the episodes of racial violence, but you get the sense of um, some of the density in South Texas and the, the episodes that move east. Um, and this is, uh, oh, in the conversion of the PDF, it's a little bit blurry, but this is an, a, give, to give you an idea of how the team members for mapping violence um, enter the database. And so we have it set up so that um, students can add the title of the event that they're researching. Um, there's an ID for the event that is working with the digital tools, you know, all the computer s stuff. Um, and you get the students that contribute to the project can we identify who started the research, um, but then also the last editor. So it, it's built for collaborative research and for collaborative um, uh, revision um, of these events. Um, we also, this is just showing you some more of the back end. Um, some of the data that we are collecting um, is multiple. So for the murder of Gregorio Cantu, for example, we are able to include the short narrative description of uh, the event that we're documenting. Um, we're also including information about the decision for, I'm pointing here, the decision for why students are, are giving this GPS location for the location. So in some of these cases, uh, we don't have an exact location. And so we want to keep records of why that place is being <coughs> marked. 
Um, is it the prison that somebody was removed from? Is it the last known residence of somebody? Um, so this does not always correspond with the location of the event. We're also complete, uh, developing a list of primary sources and secondary sources. Uh, we're collecting metadata uh, regarding the race, age, class, occupation, um, details that are known about the victims, people that are targeted with violence, but also the aggressors, which then allow us to do some of the work, the important work of tracking patterns of the movements of police um, or people that participated in multiple mobs. Um, and we also have a category for uh, relatives that are connected to the victims. Um, so this gives you a sense of the kind of data that we're collecting that moves us beyond just the dot that, that it corresponds with the event. Um, and uh, I'll talk more about this case later if we have time, but just to, to wrap up, um, one of the ways in which we're building in space for the ambiguities of historical research that can't be reflected in a GPS location um, is that we have, uh, we've had to actually amend the form. So um, for events that where we don't have an exact date, for example, we can enter in that something happened in early October 1915 as opposed to having an exact date. And we also are building in uh, that kind of flexibility for the location as well. Um, and, and to, to come back to, to leave you with just some questions about the tensions that I feel with this kind of project um, is again to come back to the statement that lives are, are the heart of this project, not metadata. And for a historian who's entering into this world of the digital humanities, there's a few things that I'm still unresolved with. I mean, on the one hand, one of, I think, the, 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 the benefits of, or what is new and exciting about digital humanities is the idea of quick data, right? Taking something you know, that represents thousands of pieces of, of, of metadata and displaying them so that they're easily consumable. And for histories of racial violence, I really think that we need to advocate in slow data um, and think about how to use digital platforms so that we can um, engage critically with the content rather than just um, making it quick and easily digestible. Right? This is not something that should be easy for people, I think, or quick for people to move from. Um, I also have a, a very reluctant about the use of what happens when something is just put online. Um, and so uh, this is a photograph that I was referring to earlier that has Texas Rangers on horseback with ropes tied to dead bodies. Um, and from our early work, we found that if there's any sort of journalism that covers our efforts for these histories, that's the photograph that they want to use. They want to publish lynching photographs. Um, and so in our exhibit, Life and Death on the Border, we were so careful <laughs> with how we had long debates about what photographs to use, at what scale. Um, and as soon as an article came out in the newspaper, we had no control of those photographs. And so also what's <laughs> awful is that when these photographs these newspaper articles then are converted onto social media, there's the thumbnail profile image. And so you have it completely out of context. Um, and so before you know it, these photographs are just circulating wildly all over Twitter and Instagram, um, and you sort of lose that curatorial um, control. Um, and uh, another example is the Bullock Museum. So before Life and Death opened, I participated in a panel on the history of the Ku Klux Klan in Texas. Um, and this was a robe that, the, that was lent to the museum by an anonymous donor, um, but there was not enough historical context on the museum floor to provide for this robe to be on display. And so they had a panel. Um, they actually revised their permanent exhibit so that at one point this could be on display in context. Um, um, but they did put it online as a part of their digital archive. And from my last conversations with the staff at the Bullock, this object is the most viewed and downloaded image. Not Stephen F. Austin's letters or reports on the Texas independence, Texas revolution, you know, not artifacts from the Alamo, this road. And it gives me pause, um, again, because we don't know who's downloading it, we don't know for what use, and because of the, the rise of white power movements and uh, white supremacy and racial violence, um, these kind of objects uh, can embolden um, or be used as celebratory objects. And so um, these are the kinds of questions that I have about
uh, the tensions with uh, and, and the need for careful, thoughtful decisions about what to make publicly accessible. Um, and of course, there is always the 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 reality that we can look at a map of Texas from Berkeley or from Providence, Rhode Island, and if we're not in the actual community, right, these histories are continue to be contentious and to divide communities. So the lynching of Antonio Rodriguez was a lynching that took place in 1910 in Edwards County. Uh, the, on the centennial anniversary, members of the community in Rock Springs came together for a commemoration to acknowledge the tragedy of the lynching. Um, but this is one case in which the County Historical Commission does not want a Texas historical marker. And so that's just, you know, it's a reminder. It took four years to unveil a marker for Bazana Longoria. It took two application, rounds of applications. Um, but that allowed for a critical conversation to develop between community organizers, descendants, the local county historical commission, the Texas historical commission, and local co community institutions that allowed for um, that unveiling to be an opportunity for healing and public dialogue that was productive. Um, and I do have reservations about what it means to have a community designated as a place where acts of racial violence took place without having those types of critical and engaging conversation. And so um, I have many, many questions, um, but I'm happy to take your questions <laughs> and, and have a dialogue about mapping violence or, or the research or or, or whatever you're interested in. Yeah. Okay. Um, Charles, you're first. Yeah, I'll try to be clear with here. <laughs> Thanks very much for your talk and for that really amazing project. Um, I have a rather strange question. If you think about the one Americo Marin has published with his pistol in his hand, um, in 1958, mm -hmm. um, he faced a little bit of censorship. They sent the manuscript out, and apparently they sent it back to him and said, well, we'll publish it as long as you take out those portions that are about the Texas Rangers. He refused to do that and said, just send me back my manuscript. They published it, but then did not have a reception, no advertising. Essentially, they buried the book. Now, that's 1958. We've, things have changed a bit, but what obstacles have you faced in both putting together this project and then trying to do uh, that wonderful task of being able to put out information and see how it is that people can productively interact with it. What are the obstacles that are still in place in 2019? Well, some of the obstacles are ha haven't changed. Yeah. And so on the one hand, the, the myth of the Texas Rangers is such a, a crucial part of how Texans um, it's a part of, of it's, a, it's an integral part of Texas culture, um, that they are heroes. Um, and if you look critically at the history, or just realistically at the history of the Texas Rangers in the, in the 19th century, all on through the 20th century, you know, these are agents um, who are performing gross acts of racial violence. And so not only are they participating in anti-Mexican violence, um, but they're also participating in genocide of native indigenous people in Texas. And while slavery is, is vibrant in Texas, they were hunting people um, who were trying to escape slavery by crossing the border into Mexico where it was outlawed. And so if you think just broadly about their role in helping to establish Texas and taming the frontier, they are, they are um, it is easy to just find the, the, the many ways in which they are agents of racial violence. Um, but in the histories that have been told, they are the heroes. And so that has been cemented not just in decades of Texas history, but in popular culture and in these cultural institutions that celebrate them as icons. And there's just this new movie coming out called Highwaymen um, that is the filmmaker says is is you know returning to uh, Frank uh, Hamer, who was one of the Texas Rangers that threatened the life of Jose Ticanales in 1918. So he later went on to capture Bonnie and Clyde, or not capture, but to surround and then kill Bonnie and Clyde. Um, and so he in this film is being celebrated as the most important law enforcement agent of the 20th century. 
Um, and so there are not only people who are invested in celebrating these icons, but preserving their place as heroes of Texas history, the Waco Texas Ranger History Museum is one of these places mm -hmm. that just overlooks this period of racial violence, um, or at worst celebrates some of the agents that committed these atrocities. And so, um, so that's all there. On the other hand, I will say that the numbers of people that are showing up to these public events speaks volumes about the number of people that are ready for a more dynamic and truthful accounting of the past. And so some of those people, it's because their families have been impacted by this violence. Um, on the other hand, it's, you know, when my book came out, I didn't quite know what to expect. Um, and sure, there was hate mail, but mm -hmm. I have been moved by the numbers of people who have written to me, not just because they heard about these histories. This is, again, thinking about the relationship between history, power, and memory but people who knew these, this other version of history that wasn't told, and they were just glad that it was finally being told. Um, but I also received emails and phone calls from people who were descendants of Texas Rangers. And in some cases, they were saying, I'm so glad that you're finally telling this history. It needs to be told. I had other people who wrote, and people have written to Refusing to Forget the Project, to say, this was my grandfather's name. I've always been proud he's a Texas Ranger. Is his name listed anywhere? Mm -hmm. Did he participate in some of these acts of violence? And so there is, you know, if you think about other contexts um, where communities and nations have to grapple with these charged histories, whether it's, you know, the Holocaust or um, apartheid in South Africa, there is a need for an engaged public conversation about these historical wounds and to trace the legacies on institutions. Um, and in Texas, the conversation is just starting. Mm -hmm. um, I, this is so fascinating and, and also so sad. And I just want to acknowledge how painful it must be for you and all this students and others working on the project. Um, just at the very end, you kind of touched on Texas in relation to our vantage point in Berkeley or, or at, from Brown or whatever. And I wonder, you know, obviously there's so much work going into this. I'm sure you can't yet take it, um, take it national and Texas probably has some specificities. But I wonder if you've thought about how to and uh, make it clear that like we're not off the hook here in California and that you know the bigger national context and that it wasn't just those racist people in Texas mm -hmm. who were doing that. Yes, because that's I think um, the quick that is the quick response to say, you know, the Texas is a crazy place. Uh, <laughs> and, like, and the South is a crazy place. Mm -hmm. And so I think some of the important projects that have been that are examples um, all, like the, the report at Brown University that was released in 2006 that studied the relationship between Brown as an institution and the history of slavery. And so um, I'm, I'm always thinking about public projects that are doing this work to say we can't, we can't isolate these period or these acts of racial violence or these institutions of violence like slavery to a particular, we can't bind them to a particular temporal period or geography. Um, and so some of that work of, of looking locally or at a, institutionally at these connections to these histories is really urgent and necessary. Um, the Refusing to Forget project is something that we've based in Texas looking at this period, but we're, we're always thinking about how to collaborate with other projects for mapping violence in particular. I'm working closely with Margaret Burnham and Melissa Noble at, um, um, who are building the uh, civil, uh, civil rights, you know, I think I have them here. Oh, I didn't get to talk about the students. It, so I'm happy to talk too about the student collaborators. Um, but the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project that's run out of Northeastern. Um, so Margaret Burnham is the law school, uh, Melissa Nobles is a dean at MIT, but they are building an archive um, and they've already researched 500 cases of people um, that were victims of racial violence um, from the 1930s throughout the 20th century that were targets, that were civil rights activists that were targeted with violence. 
Um, and so it's thinking again about adding to what we know about the history of lynchings and saying racial violence didn't end because lynchings publicly mm -hmm. stopped or slowed down. Um, and so they have not only, in, in the, some of the, the, the parallels to racial violence is that they're thinking about not only how to, it's a, they're lawyers, um, and so they have actually opened up some of these cold cases. They've also done taken other restorative steps like um, having death certificates changed. And so there was one case that I can think about in particular um, where the death certificate noted that somebody uh, was shot, but the coroners uh, reported or wrote into their report that they died of shock. Mm -hmm. And so that, that uh, resulted in it not being considered a homicide. And so you, know, you can see the ways in which that, that interrupts the abilities to, to prosecute somebody for their shooting of this person that then died of shock. And so having, um, so this is a really important effort, not only to document these cases of civil rights um, <coughs> activists and people who were, were murdered, um, and to try to open cases when they can, um, but then also to seek other forms of restorative justice, like changing death certificates, um, having death certificates issued, um, naming a street after somebody. Um, and, in, and for the case that they worked on in Texas, there are cases like in Longview, Texas, for example, where there are these cases of, of lynchings that occurred in the 19-teens and 20s. Um, and so we are thinking through how we then can find points of connection so that we can, we can have a community conversation in a place like Longview um, that is a hard place to have a conversation when you're not just talking about one event, but actually a long tradition of violence. Um, uh, there's um, Jeff Ward is also working in a project called Racial Violence Archive, um, and so that's another case that's looking at mapping um, not just uh, uh, not just racial violence, but things like church bombings. Um, and so they are are helping to they're doing a lot of crowdsourcing, uh, crowdsourcing, um, but they're developing these maps that give us ways of 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 actually looking at the connection between. Um, communities that have histories of lynchings and the prevalence for forms of violence that then take place, whether they're these acts of terror, like a church bombing, or um, corporal punishment, high, higher rates of corporal punishment in schools. Um, and so they're sociologists, and they do fancy things with numbers, and, and their mapping project is, is, is of a different scale. Um, but these are the kinds of people that I'm thinking through ways for collaboration and ways to expand this kind of project. Unfortunately, for, for mapping violence, so much of the work right now, we're in the recovery phase. And unfortunately, for every case that we know occurred that we start to research, then we find others. Um, and so the slide that I had for Robert Peters is one of these cases um, that Felicia Bevel, who's a PhD student in American Studies at Brown, she stumbled upon his case. Um, he was actually shot by a white woman um, in Fort Worth, Texas in 1911. Um, and we included it in the archive because she, was, he, she accused him of entering her home um, and accused him of, of attempted robbery. She shot him. Um, he ended up dying. Um, and rather than investigating the event, the local community celebrated her act because here was a white woman who didn't need a mob to defend her and protect her honor, um, but instead she offered swift justice, and the community actually came together and um, organized um, a fundraiser so that they could give her a diamond ring as a, uh, as a sign of their uh, appreciation and using her as an example. So there are these cases of, of white women um, that, that shoot black men in Texas that are not prosecuted um, that falls outside of, of these other projects. So we're still in the recovery phase in trying to, to include and document. Um, but one of the ways in which we're finding to collaborate is that because none of us are, are digital or computer scientists, um, we all see the limitations of these mapping platforms. And so that's one way we're trying to figure out what is the best, what kinds of platforms, what are the ways that we need these maps to interact with people for this, these histories to be legible. Okay, we have four uh, questioners and only oh, no. 10 minutes left, so we're going to go fast here. Larry, okay. and then your turn. I'll be quick. First yeah. of all, extraordinary. Uh, it's both intellectually compelling and moving at the same time. So Thank you. Drama. Um, 
I'm curious if, if, if the project has developed any kind of national purchase. In other words, um, and I guess I ask that question because I run a center here called the Center for Right Wing Studies, and I have been approached by things like the Senate Judiciary Committee and so forth. You know, recently we've had, uh, you know, we're in an age where white supremacy is, is booming, but also the, the you know, takes the king, the, you know, a, a reaction against it, um, which has been mobilized. It seems to me that what you're doing, um, you know, would, would, would form a, a significant part of the counter narrative to white supremacy. So I'm wondering if people have found you uh, in institutional settings, like the Democratic Party or Congress, or even things like the Anti-Defamation League or Southern Poverty Law, and are you participating in anything of that nature? Well, we're we certainly have been collaborating with legislators in Texas, mm -hmm. and so that has been really those partnerships with individual state representatives or senators has been important, and especially in the moments where we hit roadblocks with some of these applications for markers, for example, and so there it it has um, unfortunately though. These markers and the public, uh, the museum exhibit hasn't emboldened people who are holding on to this outdated narrative. And so there is for people who are following the, the politics in Texas and um, especially debates around public school education. You know, it was just a huge victory to change the curriculum to finally acknowledge that Texas independence was inspired by the want for Texans to be able to hold slaves. Um, because under the Mexican government, slavery was outlawed, and so the so so some of the collaboration that that has been really successful is these collaborations between historians, local educators, and politicians that are trying to shift public understanding that way. Um, but it has been hard work because that script that Mexicans are inherently violent, that Mexicans are inherently criminal, has been so hard to dislodge. Um, and so it takes so much work just to explain that this is a case of state-sanctioned racial violence. That there's a lot. Of, there's there's so much ignorance about the history, and, and I don't mean that in a in in a discriminatory way. But people know so little about the history of Latinos in the United States, but also the history of the border. And so one of the cases, this Bodney Massacre historical marker, there was actually an effort to suppress that marker from being unveiled because of local residents who said this is going to be shine a light on what's happening with these children that are being separated from their families. And so, so um, for all of those reasons, for the potential of this history to help us expose those contradictions of the policing of the border, to expose the violence and the dangers of, uh, of extra legal violence by police, that uh, the mobilization to harness that has been slower than the mobilization by some people who want to suppress it. So, um, so we're working at the state level, but I hope that we can that we can broaden out these conversations because I think you're right that it's urgent and and would be really helpful. And I think it would be really useful. Mm -hmm. okay. all right. uh, Should we maybe take all three questions so I can try to respond uh, to them? Sure. Uh, <laughs> Mooney, did you have one? Oh, wait, let's yeah. start. Yeah. With yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go here, and then we'll just try to squeeze them in. Yeah. Um, how are you using your project or planning to use your project? authority and legislation accountable for the reproduction of racial violence through police brutality. Say that again? Um, to hold authority and legislation accountable for reproducing racial violence through police brutality. Mm -hmm. Great question. Do you want to add to it? Yeah, I, um, in relation to uh, Deborah's point earlier, we have a, a cross that's lit on the hill in Albany. And you don't have to dig that far to find out that the cross was a gift to a church from the local KKK. Wow. And that in the 30s and 40s, the hills of Berkeley and all were lit with KKK crosses. That the chief of police in Berkeley went to evict a black man who was in Claremont, etc., etc., and the history of residential segregation here. And we had state, the state policy of um, attempting to, to, to genocide of Native Americans. So we have the whole, and what children are learning. So that there was just a comment to that. But my real question was, have you found that you have having to deal with this aesthetic of the 
the victim of, of racial violence must necessarily be somebody, like the injustice is in proportion to how wonderful the person was. Because no matter who it was, the injustice mm -hmm. remains, even if Uncle Larry was a jerk who was horrible to his whole family, he's mm -hmm. still a, a human being who, like is there a, a and, and I guess you get the other thing, so-and-so was a wonderful grandfather. It's like, ah, he participated in yeah. murdering people. Yeah. It's just, yeah. it means you have to deal with that. And I think that was my question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Last one is Jack. Where, uh, I was drawn to where you found your data and what form they were in. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so for the data question, it's multiple. So it, we have had to re recover cases that were referenced in newspaper archives, um, so both in Spanish and English language press coverage, but of course that doesn't, isn't comprehensive. Um, we have gone back to Texas Ranger reports in the state archives to read their reports against the grain, and so every time they described shooting a Mexican bandit for resisting arrest, that's the case for us to follow up on. Um, and we are also uh, relying on community memory. So for the first book, I looked at over 300 oral histories that had been collected and then conducted more oral histories. And so pulling from community memory for some of these cases. And then the investigation that was filed by JT Canales in 1919, those 1,600 pages, um, there are just you know some references that are sentence long that reference um, a beating or a shooting. Um, and of course, many of the cases were even where there are descriptions of 25 Mexican bandits being shot and killed by Texas Rangers. Um, in some cases, we just don't have names. So it we're sort of have a, a wide net in trying to pull together and accumulate these cases. Um, in terms of the the you know the call to to speak to what's happening now to end police brutality is such an urgent one, and one that I'm still committed to figuring out how to do that. Um, you know, one of the biggest lessons from this is that, you know, when there are investigations or when residents try to hold police accountable, um, in this historical period, it was the police who investigated those claims. And so there was a Texas Ranger investigating officer that would just systematically justify the event, either by saying this person was a criminal, the residents in that county are happy that he's gone, um, or by saying, describing this as self-defense. And so I think that one of the lessons here that is really powerful um, is that you need outside, well, number one, you have to prosecute police abuse. Um, and you also, and we're also needing to, to this, this historical period also reminds us that policing and systems of policing are interconnected. Right, so this is not just about the policing of citizens, but the policing of immigrants, and that Texas Rangers from this era go on to help build and shape the Border Patrol of 1924. Um, so you can literally have somebody move from being a, 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 a prison guard in Houston to being a Texas Ranger to then being on the Border Patrol force. And so I think that that's helpful in our current moment for efforts to end police abuse to say that we have to think about the policing of citizens and the policing of immigrants as these interconnected forms of, of state violence. And so um, I think about descendants who and, um, and uh, families that try to prosecute the murder by police officers that then never saw justice. And I think about them when I hear about cases like people who are shot by Border Patrol agents or shot by police that the families then don't seek just don't see justice um, in the form of a prosecution, and so I think that that it's it's a shame that in 1919 there was a call for an end to that kind of police violence, um, and in the state of Texas, the the government actually decided not to pr prosecute those crimes, and that's an important moment to see that the the institutions then continue those cultures of policing and cultures of violence um, if they're not prosecuted, and so uh, if you have ideas about more ways to make that that message heard now um, to shape pol po uh, policy, I would welcome it. Um, and I think one of the, 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 one of the um, conversations that we're constantly having as a research group when I meet with students, um, that's a mix of, of PhD students and undergraduate students, um, but we have conversations about each case, and so we are working through them together, which comes back to this earlier point about how heavy this history is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so do, having these conversations in person uh, help us think through, how do I describe this person? The newspapers describe this person as a potential rapist, as a brute 
Um, and so all of those, that racist language um, that's in these newspaper accounts, and we, then we think through, how do I need to narrate this so that the reader doesn't automatically come in assuming the guilt of this person who was lynched? And so that's one, one of the biggest compliments that I received from my book, um, is that a reader took that I was not, um, and this is the case for some uh, early works on the history of lynchings, that some historians in trying to recover this case actually entertained was this person guilty or innocent of what they were being accused of. And for me, I'm not, I, I don't think that we can prove that. And so what I'm interested in, more invested in, is thinking through how do we document what took place and the lasting consequences of that lynching um, and not prosecuting the mob and how did that shape uh, communities and families but also so, you know, so, so social institutions. And so, so that question about is this person worthy of, of being memorialized or is the loss of their life um, a, a valuable, uh, you know, I'm, 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 the character of the person for me is not something for me to judge or decide. Wow, um, please join me in thanking me. Thank you. And we're going to be here for a few minutes. If any of you didn't have a chance to ask a question, please come up and, and speak to us. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate all the questions. Around.